Um, I propose we go into public session. Is that agreed? Um, members of the Oireachtas attending this meeting remotely should do so within the Leinster House campus. Remote participation from outside the Leinster House campus is not possible. Today we have engagement with representatives from the Cree Centre for Peace and Reconciliation, Neve McNamee and Roisin McGlone, and you're, you're very welcome. And on behalf of the committee and all of the members, I want to welcome you to today's meeting, and we're glad that you're able to, to be with us. Um, this is a, a routine um, few sentences I have to read into the record before the, the committee formally begins its uh, evidence. The evidence of witnesses physically present or who give evidence from within the parliamentary precincts is protected pursuant to both the constitution and statute by absolute privilege. However, witnesses and participants who are to give evidence from a location outside the parliamentary precincts are asked to note that they may not benefit from the same level of immunity from legal proceedings as a witness giving evidence from within the parliamentary precincts does and may consider it appropriate to take legal advice in this matter. Witnesses are also asked to note that only evidence connected with the subject matter of the proceedings should be given and should respect directions given by the chair of the parliamentary practice to that the effect that where possible they should neither criticise nor make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable or otherwise engage in speech that might be regarded as damaging to the persons or entity's good name. I now call on Neve to give her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you very much for having us here today. It's a privilege to, to speak with you all. Um, so I wanted to um, maybe give you a little bit of context for the work that we do in Glencree. Um, we're, we're delighted, as I say, it's a great privilege to, to be invited here to address you today um, and to take the opportunity to discuss the work being undertaken by the Glencree Centre for Peace and Reconciliation. I'm joined here by my colleague, Roisin McGlone from Belfast, who's the programme manager for our Peace 4 funded programme, addressing the legacy of violence through facilitated dialogue. Uh, this opening statement introduces Glencree's work, particularly with victims and survivors in Northern Ireland and across this island. So to give you a bit of context, uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with Glencree, we were established in 1974 in response to the conflict in Northern Ireland. The Glencree, Peace and, uh, the Glencree uh, Centre for Peace and Reconciliation works to prevent and transform political conflict and intercommunal uh, conflict and build peaceful and inclusive societies. As the only dedicated peace centre in the Republic of Ireland, we bring individuals and groups impacted by conflict together and help them to find a way find pathways to reconciliation and sustain peace through facilitated dialogue, relationship building, public discourse and shared learning. So we've transformed conflict by focusing on six key programme areas. Our community and political dialogue programme works with political parties and their representatives drawn from across the islands of Ireland and Britain, as well as civic society organisations and actors integral to the political debate. We do this by creating and sustaining a process where people of different traditions, political persuasions or cultural identities can come together in confidential spaces to discuss the issues that arise as disrupting factors in their relationships with each other. Our Peace 4 funded programme focus on, focuses on addressing the legacy of violence through facilitated dialogue by working with victims and survivors groups, representatives and individuals with differing interpretations of what happened in Northern Ireland's past. We achieve this through different mechanisms of engagement and sustained contact between victims and survivors and those perceived to have inflicted harm upon them. Our intercultural and refugee programme aims to make Ireland a more welcoming and inclusive place with respect for all ethnic, faith and cultural backgrounds by facilitating intercultural dialogues among refugees, migrants and members of ethnic and faith minority communities. Our Women's Leadership Programme is closely aligned with UN Resolution 1325 and aims to support and empower women on the island of Ireland who have experience of political conflict and its effects to expand their influence and become active leaders in the political processes that promote peace building on the island of Ireland and internationally. The peace education and young adult work that we undertake aims to promote engagement among students and young adults from across the island of Ireland through peace education, shared learning and cross-border, cross-community relationship building. So one of the programmes that are included in that are, is our partnership with, pol uh, with Politics in Action in Northern Ireland, working with um, young school children in the north and in the south, engaging with politicians north and south. These programmes support young people in exploring their, their own and each other's identities and history, while at the same time allowing space for thought and action to build a shared future. The development of this work is a key priority for Glen Cree under our new strategic plan 2022 to 26, as we seek to establish a centre of excellence for practical peace building in Glen Cree, which will be focused on training and supporting the next generation of peace builders on this island. This is a particular area that we're very focused on in Glen Cree. 
The Southern Voice for Peace programme promotes an all-island civil society approach to lasting peace in Northern Ireland. This programme features a number of public events each year which seeks to engage people from the Republic of Ireland with the issues, organisations and communities in Northern Ireland in order to make a contribution to deepening reconciliation throughout the whole island. Internationally then, Glencree has supported peace efforts in over 10 countries including Haiti, Papua New Guinea, Afghanistan, Palestine, Israel and most recently in Cameroon. As well as sharing learnings from the Northern Irish peace process, this work also presents a very useful opportunity for Glen Cree to learn from the experiences of conflict transformation in other jurisdictions. Today, our focus will remain on our own shores and the work we are undertaking to address the legacy of conflict in Northern Ireland. So I'll talk to you a little bit about Roisin's programme in particular. So the Peace 4 funded programme um, addressing the legacy of conflict through facilitated dialogue. So well over two decades since the signing of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, Northern Ireland and the border counties remain divided along communal lines. A, contrib a contributing factor to this divide is the inadequacy of the Good Friday Agreement and subsequent political efforts to address the legacy of past violence. The deficit is most acutely felt in the divisive relationship between victims and survivors groups and the individuals, groups and institutions perceived to have inflicted harm upon them in the past. In 2017, Glencree was awarded four years of Peace Force funding under the Building Positive Relations Strand to target these issues through our, to our Addressing the Legacy of Violence Facilitate Dialogue programme. The programme is due to finish at the end of August 2022 after being granted an eight-month extension due to the limitations on our work inflicted by COVID-19 pandemic. The programme primarily focuses on the experience of victims and survivors groups and their communities in Northern Ireland. Through a process-based approach that creates the space for private and confidential facilitated dialogues and the promotion of sustained con contact across divides, themes and issues that remain as obstacles to deeper understanding and the promotion of positive relationship, uh, relations are examined. A crucial aspect of this programme has been that the groups, along with other relevant parties, co-develop their own process and pace of engagement prior to entering into dialogue with groups and individuals with differing interpretations of what happened in the past. The primary objectives of this programme have been increased empathy and understanding and acknowledgement of other stories and lived experience, experiences, transformed social and political attitudes, decreased sectarianism, increased profile of women and women's stories within the legacy context, increased confidence within victims and survivors groups that are perceived as being hard to reach. The learning we've accrued through this project has been and will continue to be shared on a national and international platforms via journal publications, webinars, reports, roundtables and symposia with victims and survivors groups, other interest groups, academics, policymakers and practitioners to assist in ascertaining how to productively engage with Northern Ireland's contentious past. On reflecting on the lifetime of the project to date, whilst progress has been made in some areas, what is evident is that the political processes in place to address the issues faced by victims and survivors remain inadequate in both jurisdictions. The social and political context in which the programme has operated has been extremely challenging. As the committee would appreciate, legacy issues are very contested and the work has had to navigate major upheaval during the programme life cycle, including a sustained collapse of the Stormont Assembly, Brexit, ongoing disagreements over the Northern Ireland Protocol, failure to implement the Stormont House Agreement, recent legacy proposals from the UK government, and indeed the COVID-19 pandemic. In this context, it has been vital that our programme has the flexibility to be responsive to social and political change. Victims and survivors groups and other programme participants can re-evaluate their strategic priorities, alter or reprioritize specific goals, and seek to delay or accelerate particular facets of dialogue processes in response to changing contexts. This can present significant challenges for the type of work the Legacy of Violence programme is undertaking. Despite the Peace Force funding drawing to a close in August, Glencree remains committed to work with victims and survivors in Northern Ireland, a commitment that has been embedded in Glencree's uh, new five-year strategic plan 2022-26, to which will be formally launched in the coming weeks at Dublin Castle. We welcome questions now from the committee and thank you again for the opportunity to discuss our work with you. And thank you very much, Neve. The order of speakers' um, contributions from different um, pa political parties and groupings is Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Sinn Féin, SDLP MPs and Alliance MPs, Green Party, Sinn Féin MPs, Labour, and then the Independents and ANTO. Neil Blaney had indicated, I understand. Was he here? No, he wasn't there and he's just stepped away. Yeah. Pauline, I understand. Do you need to get away? I, I don't mind. I, 
I, I, would, would you I take your go. contribution now? I think you have commitments in the Dáil. Yeah. I yeah, can, if I you take your contribution, contribution okay. then we'll go back to Neil. Is that okay? Because okay? no, no he has some other meeting as well. Okay, that's great. Thanks. So, okay. um, the Fáilte Róg, Cigan Cranew, um, I'm delighted to, to, to meet you here today and to listen to your presentation. I suppose Sinn Féin recognises that we're in a post-conflict um, society now and there's a need for reconciliation, which is reflective of everyone in society. And like... Our members um, have been involved and have contributed with others to bring about a peace and political process in the North. And I suppose we've been involved in negotiations with other governments, with other parties, with NGOs, with civic society. And we've led to the Good Friday Agreement and subsequent uh, agreements. But the absence of Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I think, leaves victims and survivors without a recognised recourse for truth and justice. So in your opening statement, you identify addressing the legacy of violence through facilitated dialogue, and it's funded by Peace 4. So I'm just wondering how you measured the success of that project. So, I mean, for example, how many participants took place, how representative were they from victims and survivors? Um, were there common threads coming from um, the different individuals or organisations that you work with? And you know, how much progress has been recently made, I suppose? And in that context as well, with your consultations with the people you met and the organisations you met, particularly from the victim and survivors groups, um, have you come across anyone who supports the British government's uh, proposed amnesty legislation? Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Tully. Um, Roisin? Yeah, I'll take that question if you don't mind, Colleen. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'd like to start at the end first, and then because that's the easiest question okay. to start with, and that is that, no, we haven't met anybody in the victims and survivor groups that support the British government's um, uh, command paper. Um, I would stress at this stage is we won't be identifying, we don't represent victims and survivors. Mm. We work alongside victims and survivors, so we're not here to represent anyone. And we keep confidential the groups that we work with. But I can absolutely guarantee you that we work with groups from every facet of uh, groups set up to work with victims and survivors in uh, the North and Northern Ireland. So, I mean, people who have been killed by the state and people who have... Uh, members who were members of state forces so we work with all of all victims and we haven't we haven't come we haven't met anyone who doesn't agree now i will preface that or i'll, I'll just say that that doesn't mean they all don't agree with it for the same reason yeah okay mm -hmm. but no there's there's none of the groups that we work with and we're talking about thousands of people that we that we would work with groups representing thousands of people they represent the, the groups and we work with the main um people and representatives in those groups and wider groups um do you know something? I was going to print out the numbers because one of the things that these, the European is very good at is looking for figures. And I was going to print them out and I didn't, but I can supply you with those. But we're in the region of almost a thousand uh, contacts with people over the four years. We have multiple contacts, so we're, you mm -hmm. know, there's multiple contacts with people. So we would work with four large, hard to reach groups as well as doing bigger events. Um, I don't think any of you. Uh, were able to attend the Kibosh Theatre Company. We put on a play in Dublin, those you pass in the street, uh, um, in November. I know your chair was there. That was um, in Dublin Castle. In Dublin I Castle. actually had hoped to get there, and then yeah. something um, well, clashed with I was, I was saying to, to Paul, there was a production company there, and they'll be producing a video, and I will let you have access to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is about using different means. That, that probably is the, the public-facing way that we can bring people victims together that isn't the majority of our work it's a bit like an iceberg you know 10% of it is above the surface and okay. public facing and then 90% of it is in quiet rooms facilitating quiet dialogues um, so does that answer some of the questions that it you does. asked yeah yeah Eve? If I could just add to yeah. that, um, you asked particularly Deputy how we measure success. So I think when you have objectives around increasing empathy, understanding, shifting mindsets, that's, that's, I think it, it goes across the work that Glencree does. It, it can be quite difficult to measure at times. It's not, um, you know, it's not just a kind of a simple kind of quantitative uh, you know, analysis, but the programme um, is, is formally evaluated throughout the life cycle of it. Okay. One thing that's very important to the work of Glencree in general is the principle of co-design. So while we have a planned series of engagements through the, the Glencree models that we use around facilitating dialogue and building relationships, and as Roshan has mentioned, using different mechanisms, whether it be the arts or um, you know, just having opportunities for people to get together, um, I suppose these these things uh, in terms of how people are coming along with a single identity work and then being willing to meet with those from other communities or have different views 
there are, I suppose, bespoke models for how we can measure that and kind of, you know, how things are shifted along, but it's not straightforward. Um, I think we're, we're quite lucky to work with um, SEUPB, with a funder who, who understands this and understands the nature of the work, the sensitive nature of it. Really, the, the crux of what Glen Cree does, as um, Roshan has said, we don't represent victims and survivors, we walk along with them. So okay. we have our, our planned um, level of activity and then also remain flexible to what is going on in the socio-political context, but what the victims want themselves, what they want to see happen. I think when we're talking about victims and survivors and what they've been through, the power has been taken away from them. So when it comes to the process of reconciliation or you know, people being able to work through the issues that they have, giving them some power in that is hugely, hugely important. And that's, is, that's an important part of what Glen Cree does in terms of supporting them through that process. I hope that helps yeah, give a little bit more context. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know my colleague Mickey Brady wanted to come yeah, in as I well. Bring in. That's, yeah. um, Mickey Brady MP, are you okay? Can you hear us, Mickey? Sorry, just I'm on on on, on muted now. Yes. Uh, can Go ahead, got, uh, and yeah. um, um, thanks very much for the presentation. It's, it's been very informative and, and interesting. Now I think we we, we recognise that there are many challenges in um, bringing um, people together, and um, obviously there has to be uh, coordination and contact. And I'm just wondering if you could um, maybe explain the best way of ensuring that everybody who needs to be around the table, is around the table and is included. I think that would be my first question. The um, second question that I have, um, and it's been a topic of, of much conversation recently, is the um, advent of an all-island citizens' assembly. And that could be a way of gathering, gathering representative, representative uh, views across society. And I'm just wondering if uh, what your views are on that. And after, if that was um, convened, then any recommendations and um, opinions, et cetera, et cetera, could be uh, brought back to Eroctus for discussion. So that would be my two questions at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Mickey. Roisin or Neve, whichever. Maybe together, Roisin. Yeah, I, I, and, and Mickey, one of the things that, that Neve said there that I think is particularly important um, is, is the fact that we don't dictate the victims, but what we do is encourage them to have the people around the table that can help them and can, can work with them. Um, and there has been enormous success in terms of walking with people on a journey. Um, I think that, that sometimes people view victims as people who are out there. You know, they're different from all the rest of us. You know, they're exactly the same as, as, as we are. They have fears and concerns and anxieties, the same that we have. And the, the beauty of a project like ours is that there's no rush. We can take things at people's pace. But I would say that um, that the, the, the outward looking, um, you know, the, the, public, the public looking aspect of our project, I suppose they're, they're, when you go back seven years, because that's when the, the funding was first um, thought about in Glen Cree and was, the negotiations were entered into by the Special European Programme body, it was probably felt at that stage that we would be an awful lot further on. Because if you remember in, the, in, in the, that, those seven years, there's been the Stormont Assembly and all our groups are from the north. One of the groups that we work with does work with some groups in the south, um, some victims in the south. But you know, we thought we'd be an awful lot further on and that was what we were alluding to in the, the end part of the statement, which was about the political and social and cultural background to this work, it has been very, very difficult um, and it's been painstaking. But I think we've had, we, we have the people around the table who need to be around the table. And I know that Neve, in particular um, would know more about the All-Ireland situation um, than I would. So maybe she wants to follow on with that. Yeah, just, just to add to that, if I may, um, in terms of you know, making sure the right people are around the table, that's really, really important to the work of Glen Creed, that um, you know, all voices are represented. I suppose with, with Roisin's uh, programme and also across the work of Glen Cree, we find people who are at different levels or at different kind of places in their journey, as it were. Um, there's, no, there's no kind of you know, standard approach for everyone. We kind of meet people where they are. So there, are, there may be individuals or groups who require you know, kind of a bit more one-to-one -one work. Um, we have to work harder at developing trust um, with some. Whatever, whatever it takes to kind of keep those conversations going, to kind of build that trust, to make sure that people are feel comfortable and safe engaging 
open with the dialogue. That's of paramount importance to us. Um, really not to oversimplify it, but the work across Glencree boils down to two things. It is building improbable relationships across divides and facilitating difficult dialogue. In order to do that, we have to create a very safe space and our, our trust um, is, you know, the trust that we have with the participants, those we work with, our reputation is one of our greatest assets in Glencree. With almost 50 years now of experience, um, that is something that stands to us. I suppose we can go into, again, because of the quiet, um, you know, confidential nature of the work and people's uh, faith that, you know, that won't be breached. Um, you know, we can go into places, we can engage with people that, that are very hard to reach or that are reluctant to come to the table. But as I said, for us, um, we, we kind of we don't make exceptions. We ensure that everyone who needs to be is at that table, and whatever we have to do to work towards that um, with, within the context of our work, we do. Um, in relation to your question around an all island assembly, look, um, I suppose from Glen Cree's perspective, we're absolutely in favour of conversation, of engaging with one another. Um, I think there's been great success in citizens' assemblies and in um, you know kind of hearing people's voices. I think if it's done well and if it's done respectfully and um, you know kind of vo voices are heard around what it is that need to be said, they can work extremely well. So in principle, yes, Glen Cree is absolutely in favour of open, honest, public, transparent dialogue. But again, the I suppose the we'd have a particular interest in the how that's done, in the facilitation, the mediation of that dialogue. Um, again, with the principles we have around creating safe space and trust and respectful dialogue, that it's not a, a nothing descends into a political, you know, kind of a, a political kind of a positional kind of politics back and forth. That it is kind of an open, honest exchange. But as I said, there's there's great benefit to that. So in Glencree, yes, we are we are in favour of in favour of talking. Oshin, are you okay? Well, I, I, I suppose um, I would just refer back maybe to the debacle that was the Civic Forum um, in, in the North. I was a member of the Civic Forum in Northern Ireland. And um, it does come down to, for me, the success or failure of these sorts of you know, large projects. Um, bring it in, representatives from civic society comes down to how it's serviced, how it's mediated, how it's facilitated. Um, I won't make any comment on, on, on the Civic Forum, but it was a very large experiment in um, bringing civic society together, and you, you may have your, your views one way or another. So I agree with Neve. Um, you know, we, my expertise lies in how you create the safe space and how you, how you uh, facilitate that dialogue without alienating people and making people feel comfortable, and that's what Glen Cree is about as well. So that's the part that I feel is critical for, you know, you're, you're saying for, you know, if you're asking from the committee perspective, that's the critical part of it. Thanks, Roshi. Mickey, there's two minutes left in this slot. Do you want to make a final comment? Yeah, just uh, th thanks. And obviously, um, part of the difficulty is, as you say, the whole um, confidentiality, I suppose, of it and the, the um, issues in getting groups around the table, who probably in many cases fundamentally disagree about many things. And I think you have been successful, uh, as far as I'm aware, of getting disparate groups together and, and, and going through stuff. I suppose the, the, the other question um, I have, and again, it's something that's very topical at the moment, is the whole uh, issue around the constitutional issues and indeed the um, parts of the Good Friday and we are the committee that's uh, involved in the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. And I think um, Neve mentioned some of the inadequacies of the Good Friday Agreement. But I think part of the difficulty is that the Good Friday Agreement has many parts that simply haven't been implemented. And one of those is obviously around the whole referendum and the board of poll. So I'm just wondering, do you have any particular views on that? Or is that something outside your remit? Thanks, Mickey. Neve, we have limited time just on this stuff. Sure. So. Just to say, we Glencree does not take a position on the constitutional question. That is not our not our place to pass comment on that. Um, I, I would just clarify that when we mention adequacies in the Good Friday Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement was a massive achievement, and um, we're, we're not. I suppose I, I would never want to take away from that. When I mention inadequacies, I, I'm purely talking about the victims and survivor sector and how the, the provisions where we're not there around that. In terms of the constitutional question, in our broader work, what we find is very unhelpful is front-loading the destination. So the idea that this is 
a fait accompli or we're going to get to that point um, you know, at some stage anyway, that's very, very unhelpful for the conversation. Um, you know, as far as we're concerned, our interest is in finding ways to live peacefully together. So whatever form that takes um, in terms of political change that we might see over the next 10, 15, 20 years uh, on this island. Um, so as I said, Glencree, we do not take a position on the constitutional question. Thanks, Neve. The next start is Fianna Fáil. Senator Neil Blaney. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I welcome both Roshi and Neve and today. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I was between meetings, so I got some of it. I didn't get all of it, but, but I, I read it beforehand. Um, and I tried to get off in the office, and I didn't manage that, and I came back down again. Um, I, I'm very much aware of the work that you have done over the years, um, pre-Good Friday and post-Good Friday. Um, I spent a weekend um, in Glencree quite a number of years ago in the Nauties, um, and I'm very much aware of the vital work that you do. Um, but I suppose today, for the purposes of, of the committee um, uh, and your presence here, um, I wonder would it be possible if you could give a, a view as to your input into the leading up to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, how vital were you as an organisation in shipping the ground, let's say, uh, in the lead in to the Good Friday Agreement, and also thereafter, post Good Friday Agreement, um, how vital was the work that you done in relation to that? And I suppose, following on from that, um, there's a narrative that um, in um, any future border poll, um, some will call for sooner and others later, and, and I, I understand you can't take uh, a side, and I'm not asking you to. But there's a narrative out there that a citizen assembly would need to be held um, in the lead up to that to deal with issues. Um, and again, not asking you to take sides, um, but maybe you may have some opinion in relation to that. Um, because certainly from my perspective, the difficulties and the divergence of opinion um, is so great that it's going to take something much greater than a citizens' assembly to um, get everybody to the one space, and we have an awful lot of work to do. Something that, in my view, a citizens' assembly um, could not take on the, the the disparity of work, the amount of work involved. Um, let's say take it back to pre Good Friday Agreement, the amount of work that was done behind the scenes to get agreement across the lines. Um, the massive amount of work and the bank channeling. Um, could you give us maybe a flavour of some of that and not to do down a citizen's assembly, but can you give us a taste of maybe what is involved? Um, how many more like you are out there behind the scenes doing this bank channel work, bank channel work if I can call it that? Um, and just generally, what's, what's, what's your view? Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, Senator Benny. Neve. I would say, and thank you for your, for your questions, um, quite interesting. I suppose um, I'm a little bit biased in saying, you know, in terms of, of how uh, integral or important Glencree's role was, I would say very. Um, there, Glencree is the only peace centre in the Republic of Ireland. Um, we have Corrymeela in the north um, as well, but I suppose the difference with Glencree is that we are, we're, we have no religious affiliations in, um, in Glencree. We are kind of a secular organisation. So as I mentioned, Glencree has been going for 50 years um, and our work has, has evolved throughout that to support the peace process on this island and to engage the people in the north, the people across the island who are doing this. There's a very strong public service ethic in Glencree. We are a resource for, for, for the state, for communities in the north. Um, you know, we, we work with, um, with politicians in, in London and with kind of individuals in the UK as well. Um, I suppose, you know, I'll come on to the issue of a, of a, of a citizens assembly or kind of a, a public forum, but there, I think there needs to be a place. It's essential that there are that there are places, there are environments where people can come away from the public eye, can come away from the media, can come away from the pressure of party lines and engage with each other, each other as human beings, addressing the issues that are coming up for people. We need to be creative about this. Um, you know, we're in a very, very precarious time after after Brexit. Um, 
you know, so much work has been done by people in Northern Ireland, you know, on this side of the border, around the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. A, a lot of great work, but we're still not yet there yet. We've made mistakes. There is much that still needs to happen. Um, Brexit, as, as I'm sure you can all appreciate, it has put so much pressure on relationships that were, were so hard won, that we worked so hard to help create. Um, and that is something that has kept us very, very busy in Glencree over, over the last uh, six years almost now. Um, so I suppose that work, that private confidential work, um, those safe spaces where things are very, very con contentious, to be able to work through, through, the, through those issues in a safe space, to be able to you know, disagree in private, kind of come back together, work on that relationship, but have that commitment to work together regardless of the divides, there, there's a support there with organisations like Glen Cree that we can offer to help people do that. Um, and that is something, I mean, we, we would still engage regularly with, with those actors from the peace process who help negotiate the Good Friday Agreement. And that's one comment in particular that stood out to me, and it came from a fairly senior unionist politician, that his biggest regret was that the importance of establishing and maintaining those relationships across divides. He would concerned that the importance of that was lost in the years since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. So that really, that really is the strong focus, um, strong focus for us in Glen Cree. Um, in terms of, of, of again, Citizens, Citizens Assembly, um, you know, again, as Roshan has said, and as we kind of feel strongly about in Glen Cree, we're in support of the, I think, the idea of in, in principle, but it depends on how it's done. Um, it depends on the, the mediation, the facilitation um, facility that's set up around that, the, the, the nature of the space. Um, you know, how that is done, that people are encouraged to engage in a kind of professional, courteous, meaningful way. Um, and again, with, with kind of a sense of creativity, I, look, this issue is not something we can avoid, the, the kind of the constitutional question and the discussions around it, nor should we. We need to all, I think, take seriously our responsibility for contributing to the, the ideas of, of how we want to live together in the future. How I mean, we've experienced so much change on these two islands um, over, over thousands of years. Um, we need to, I suppose, not sleepwalk into the future around this and engage well with one another on, on how that happens. Um, but again, I just, I just would have some concern about um, how that's done. I think, look, the idea of a, of a border pull, what would, what would scare me quite significantly is the idea that, you know, you might have 50, 51 percent, 52 percent in favour. And, you know, what, what about the rest? You know, in terms of the principle of, of consent, um, yes, you know, the, the, there's, there's very clear legal provisions in the Good Friday Agreement, all, sign, all sides signed up to that. But we've seen the, the contentious nature of the Brexit vote. We've seen what that's done to communities, to relationships within the UK, obviously with ourselves. For me, there's an awful lot more work that needs to be done. And it is, it is painstaking at times. It requires a lot of patience. It can be frustrating. But that informal diplomacy, that back-channel discussion, getting people ready to come to the table and engage in that debate is crucial. So again, that is, that is what Glen Cree does. That is where we come in and, as always, we stand ready to help in that in whatever which way we can. Um, we would also work closely with individuals and smaller organisations who are working for the, 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 same, the same goals, you know, around peace and reconciliation. Um, so, as I said, as was Glen Cree being the only peace centre in, in the Republic of Ireland um, and the experience, unique experience that we do have, we feel we have this strong responsibility to contribute in any way we can. Um, but but you're, you're right, Senator, in terms of the, um, the role that Glen Cree played uh, in, in getting kind of younger politicians, civil servants, community actors, combatants, former combatants, victim survivors together leading up to the Good Friday Agreement and how important that was when a relationship or a conversation broke down. Again, Glen Cree was able to go places where others may not or state actors may not. Um, and again, as I said, we take that responsibility and that role very seriously. That has continued uh, throughout the implementation phase um, through the different negotiations, but also Brexit, as, as I mentioned. Um, from the time that the, the vote was announced to this, this very day, um, you know, our teams have expanded working in that area. And as I said, we're working very closely with London as well in a time where relationships east and west are probably at their most fragile in well over 50 years. So, you know, we, we put a lot of stock in, in the work that we do. It has to be quiet, it has to be under the radar, and, you know, not many people know about it at times, but um, it is essential and something that we are committed to continuing, it, to continuing on um, as we navigate through these, these very difficult or turbulent times that we're facing politically. Thanks, Neve Roisin. Um, I can't speak to uh, Glen Cree's role in 
pre-Good Friday Agreement, post-Good Friday Agreement, because I wasn't there. I was in Belfast, Stanton and Interfaces. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is there were various themes that came out of that. And one of the things that I would say is that, um, and I think if you take what Neve just finished on Brexit there, you know, the ex example of Brexit and how it was managed or maybe not managed, um, depending on your perspective. Um, what was different about coming up to the Good Friday Agreement was um, a lot of different things. It was a la multi-layered and very complex set of issues. And our civic society were very engaged. It was a very exciting time. It was a very dangerous time for us, but it was a very exciting time. But that was because civic society were engaged in the discussions. They were engaged in everything from the referendum to the setting up of the Praise Commission, to the setting up of the Human Rights Commission, to setting up whatever. So any, any a, a attempt at looking at a change in whether you call it constitutional change or whatever, has to engage on a number of different levels. And it's almost like when I remember back to those times, it was almost like we were all involved. Everybody was involved in one aspect or another. Some of us were involved on the ground, keeping the peace so as the politicians could get on with it. Some people were involved in, you know, um, like as I say, the Human Rights Commission, it was about, you know, making sure it was done the right way and whatever. And it was about advising government. You know, a lot of very vibrant, really good organisations. I mean, I remember, this always sticks in my mind, but I remember coming up with a referendum one of the organisations actually got um, see-through stickers and put it on the green traffic lights in every traffic light in Belfast, so as when it turned to green, it said yes. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, innovative ways of, of bringing people on board, and that's so critically important. I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about this aspect of it because I've, I've lived through it and know the consequences of it. So, you know, there, there has to be the spaces. There has to be the spaces and politicians. I mean, there also needs to be partnerships. I mean, remember, we had people from South Africa over helping us. We had people from, I was in Bo I went over to, to um, the John F. Kennedy School of Governance with, with political parties. There, you know, um, Stam Stamford University was involved. You know, there were academic people helping as well. There's a whole range of people that need to be brought together. And, you know, for me, thinking about it, what Clem Cree is the perfect, beautiful setting to do some of that and to do some of that background work with the people that need to help us through. Because you, you're right, it can't be done with one group or you know one assembly or one whatever. There has to be so many inter, yeah. interweaved issues. And I suppose coming back to something that I didn't answer, I'm sorry about this. But I didn't answer in your, it was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We didn't have that, you know, but there was lots of storytelling. There was lots of things happening um, in the North Northern Ireland. So uh, sorry if that may answer your question on that. Thanks, Roisin Neil. Senator Blaney. Um, thank you very much for the answers. Um, and I suppose um, you're right, the conversations do have to be had and everybody's calling for them. Um, but we also have to be very, very careful about our conversations. Mm -hmm. And I suppose what you're highlighting today is that not all these conversations can be had in one room. Yep. And that's where a citizen assembly, um, it has to be a bigger picture than a much bigger picture than a citizen assembly in my view. And um, it's good to have this, this aired today. Um, it's really good. And, you know, it's good to have that of a picture of the work that was involved in the run up to the Good Friday Agreement because um, one of my biggest fears is having that border pole and it failing. Mm -hmm. And where that leaves us as a nation, mm -hmm. where that leaves us um, as Catholic Protestant in the in this island, um, how far back does that leave relations? And that's, I suppose, um, a space we do not want to get into, um, but moreover, uh, and, I, and I, I know that COVID um, has impacted your, you and your work as much as, uh, as anybody on the island, um, but I, I really look forward to, to engaging with you and, and your work uh, in, the, in the years ahead, and we look forward to um, invites to Glen Creek and um, sharing in conversations and step by step moving the conversation forward um, in, in a way that's inclusive um, and it's about taking everybody on board um, in a manner that um, has 
diversity of view and respective opinion across the board. And uh, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Blaine. Neve, do you make any concluding comment in regard to Senator Blaney's contributions? Is there anything in particular you wish? Just to say that, um, as I said, uh, Senator, thank you for your, your comments. Um, Glen Cree always stands ready. You're, you're always very welcome yourself on this committee. Um, if ever we can assist you with certain conversations, or as I said, you're always welcome to kind of engage with our events. I think it, it, it's really important to have that political engagement, so we really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Neve. Senator John McGahan. Senator McGahan. Uh, yeah, Brendan. I'm just here in my office. Thanks so much, Chair. Uh, uh, just to my colleagues, um, have, uh, apologies, I'm the sole Fine Gael person here today. My colleague, Senator E. McCurry, is in Fermanagh, and uh, Deputy O'Dowd and Deputy McNeil have given their apologies. And Chair, I, I also have another meeting here in Leicester at 3 p.m., so I'll just have to leave at 5 to 3, so I won't be here for the second round of Fine questions. I have four or five questions, uh, and I just might be... Uh, Chair, do, is it 15 minutes I have? Yes, myself? yes, Senator. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Uh, so, with, with that in mind, what I'll do is I might just ask one question instead of a couple at once, and you, you can answer and I'll move on. So, just there in one of your opening statements, you said that it's uh, Northern Ireland and the border counties in particular remain more divided among uh, along communal lines. Uh, and coming from a border area, I couldn't agree more. But I just was wondering, in your view, why do you believe that Northern Ireland is more divided today than it was perhaps 20 years ago? Or what, what are your views on that? I'll take that one because I I, I, um, I frequent those areas quite well. I don't live in I live in Belfast, um, but I frequent the areas. I I think there are a whole complexity of reasons why sectarianism has um, reared its head. And you know I often we, we can be very disparaging of ourselves. You know in terms of you know we're really nice to outsiders. We just don't like one another. You know from growing up in, in the north and in Belfast. And, you know, a lot of that, there's a certain bit of truth in that, you know. Um, and I know this is going to sound very counterintuitive, but the, reason, the, 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 the reasoning is sectarianism isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I know that is counterintuitive, because what it does is people were saying it behind closed doors, and now maybe they're saying it um, out in the open. I would much prefer to facilitate a session where people are putting those things out on the table of how they think. Because until that's gotten rid of and until that's gotten out, um, we really, you, you have a lot of resistance and a lot of difficulty. And if you if you take that as a, as a, a microcosm and you put it to a society, maybe we needed to have the conversations. I think we went through a number of cycles because the first cycle was don't talk about the war, okay? So there was so many different manifestations of that. Everything from people not saying what they did or who they were with or going into other areas. And I agree, it wasn't talk about the war. Then we had a period where there was a very much a, an upheaval in people talking about stuff. And then we've, we, we've sort of come around. And it does come back to the fact that we don't have a shared understanding of what caused the conflict. We don't have a shared understanding of what caused the war. And so people are vying for position in terms of, well, who was it that caused it? Um, so I suppose the other thing that I would say, and I suppose you would, m your response to this might be, or oh, you would say that anyway, is the rise in social media. You know, the rise in social media has has an enormous impact because where people were talking behind closed doors and maybe in community groups and whatever, they're now saying it and have access to, you know, tens of thousands of people, millions of people. So I, you know, I don't have the answer to what you're saying, but I would just caution you and say it isn't necessarily a bad thing because people are braver now to say things that they really feel, whereas it might have eaten them up inside. And a society that's eaten itself up inside is not a good society because it's, it manifests in lots of different ways. You know, the, the psychologists say the body holds the score. Well, I believe that in a bigger arena in terms of a society, the society holds the score. And we've been through a lot of pain and a lot of trauma and we live with that pain and trauma, and it was a society that lives with a lot of pain and trauma. And some of the ways of getting through that is to talk about it. So I yes. don't know if that answers your... It doesn't answer your question, I know, but at least it no, alludes it to... No, no, that's, that's excellent, like, and it, and it really does. And, and I, I get what you're saying in that it's actually, you know, it's easier for opposing views to be shared and to be discussed rather than being bottled up and kept within their own communities. So I, I, that, that makes absolute sense to me. Um, I suppose the other thing when you said about what's missing in Northern Ireland at the moment is, is a shared understanding and context of what caused the conflict. Um, do you think we will ever get to a stage where there will be that shared understanding? 
I've been lucky enough. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. I've been lucky enough um, to study peace processes throughout the world. Um, I've also been out to, um, you know, South Africa and Macedonia and, and whatever. And there's no perfect peace process. There's no perfect society out there. There is no perfect society that has come through conflict. I'm very proud of where I come from, so I would say that I think we've done we've done good. Um, you know, as Neve said, you know, we said yes, there was difficulties in the Good Friday Agreement, particularly around the issues of victims and survivors. They should have been central to the agreement, and they weren't. It's just as simple as that, in my opinion. Sorry, in my humble opinion, they should have been central. They weren't. But look what else we did. So what I would say is, no, I don't think we're ever going to get a shared understanding. But I do think that we can share with each other our understandings and get a better idea of where other people are coming from, as opposed to taking up positions. Because taking up positions get us nowhere. Yeah. Um, my next question Sorry, would be, uh, you mentioned McGann. there, along the lines of, there's, uh, like, naturally enough, there's been huge upheaval in Northern Ireland over the last couple of years between Brexit, the protocol, all of this. So how have you, as a centre, been able to manage that upheaval? Uh, what have you had to implement to try and be more flexible to kind of manoeuvre an ever-shifting landscape since 2016? Thanks, Senator Neve. Yeah, if I could just... Um, see, uh, Tommy, you've, you've brought up Brexit there. Um, I, I think just in your 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 previous question about the Northern Irish uh, kind of Northern Ireland societies kind of being divided and kind of border division. Um, again, I mean, obviously, Roshan coming from that area, but I would say that. Brexit um, has forced the issue of identity to the fore again. So identity being a very, very complex um, issue and a, you know, a very strong part of the conflict in the North, it was very, um, you know, very eloquently dealt with in the Good Friday Agreement in that people could be British or Irish or both. With Brexit, it has forced that back into a black and white realm where people have to choose. And all the conversations about protocol, about Article 16, the, you know, a big impact on how relations have broken down and people have gone back into their camp in our experience has been around this issue of identity again, of being forced to choose. So I just wanted to kind of make that point. Um, and just on your, your question around a shared understanding, um, I would agree absolutely with Roisin in that um, you know, it's 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 probably not going to happen, and it's not necessarily likely. But it also doesn't need to happen. I would say, um, in that I think if there's shared commitment and understanding in terms of where we want to get to, uh, or, or you know that, as in, you know, kind of a peaceful future, living well together, not you know going back to a previous comment, not front loading the destination of what that's going to look like, um, but that commitment to actually engaging with one another. You know, there's no issue with people having their different narratives once they're prepared to listen and engage with with one another. Um, so I think I think Brexit, Brexit has put a with all of the work and the momentum and this the sense of pushing a boulder up the hill with the peace process and its implementation. Brexit has been one of the most disturbing factors in that whole process um, since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, again, that that issue of identity people going back into their camps. So how we've experienced it is that people are less likely to engage. They've maybe stepped back a little bit. There's much more work needed to do on a, on a kind of a one-to-one -one basis. Um, you know, kind of a lot, a lot more patience required in certain areas. It's, you know, two steps forward, one step back at times. But again, that, that just tenacity and determination and patience for moving forward with that for, from Glen Cree and us supporting people with that is of paramount importance to us. Um, I think, look, with, again, those relationships, you know, social media, with, with different things that happen from a political perspective, different announcements that are made from the EU or commentary from, from British politicians or Irish politicians, and the impact that has on people's willingness to come to the table. Things may be taken out of context or they, they may have been said in the heat of the moment, but the impact that has on relationships behind the scenes and people's willingness to talk or engage engage cannot be um, you know it cannot be overestimated that's something that we grapple with on a regular basis um, but again we are the, I suppose, the people who because of our nature the confidentiality the subtlety we're able to try and go in and repair those relationships uh, where possible but it is a it is a long process and there's been many like I said many setbacks over the years since the the, the brexit uh, vote it's you know it's difficult but again it's just that strong commitment to keep moving forward and commitment to the peace process yeah, I think I think what I find really interesting about two, both of you, at the, the, how the two of you have mentioned how the impact of social media has come along, and I guess um, social media wasn't a, you know huge thing a couple of years ago, uh, let alone recently. And I've had this uh, conversation with uh, people in Sinn Fein that I know, people in Sinn Fein that I'm friendly with, and I've said to them like, how do 
And what, what would your views on this be? If we look at, say, if, if I was a unionist in Northern Ireland and I'm looking at some of the anti-unionist rhetoric that I see coming of, you know, public or people both in pain, whatever, where, and it's, it's a plenty, not something I'm making up with this. Do you think that would isolate them or do you think that would then make them pull back their horns a little bit that they don't want to get involved with some of the some of the programs you're running or what's to do with that do you think social media in the particular thing I'm talking about creates a real wedge? I'm not going to talk specifically about one coming to the other, but two things I will say to you about working with the groups that I work with. One is the one thing that they are all united on is they didn't want to happen what happened to them. Okay? So we need to be very cognizant of the fact that people are suffering. The second thing is, yes, I would say that very often I would be in groups and, and one of the things we try to record is the context of our meetings, you know, so that over a period of eight years and very often it's local stuff that will come up in the groups. It's not national stuff, it's not international stuff. It will be, look what happened on, you know, the UTV news or the BBC Northern Ireland news. Did you see such and such did that? Or or Twitter, or Facebook, or whatever. But, you know, just referring back to what I said before, that's what you work on. That's what you have the conversations about, because it's out there. It's out there, and it's out in the open. But I would say that very often, the context within the groups that I work with is very impacted by local politics. Thanks, um, Jean. Senator McGahan. Yeah, how much longer do I have, Chair? What, five minutes, is it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Just two more questions. Uh, just to go back on to the, the funding uh, of Glen Cree. So you mentioned there that the PC funding uh, is due to uh, come to a close. Uh, yeah, come to a close in August of this year. So what are the alternative funding streams you have uh, lined up? Sure. So uh, Glen Cree are largely supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade here to the Reconciliation Fund. And some of our legacy work continues under our community political dialogue. But we will be seeking new sources of funding to continue on the work um, that Roisin has undertaken. I suppose the work on this particular programme um, is, you know, is very, very specialist, very, very sensitive work. Um, and, you know, so again, just with the different layers of the work that we do in the victims and survivors sector, it's very, very important for us to kind of continue that on. Um, so we will be seeking other sources of funding uh, for that. Um, we're looking at uh, the Peace Plus funding when that's announced as well uh, further down the line. Um, but we are funded, we've recently diversified our funding over the past three years and uh, would have funding from different philanthropic organisations and um, different other kind of funding bodies. So for us, um, really the key thing is, I mean, as Roisin has said, um, you know, we've had four years for this programme and having that time, having multi-annual funding is really, really important for that. It's not something that you can say, right, we have a year, there's an annual fund, we're going to do X number of, of events. You really have to kind of engage, you know, meet people with, you know, where they are, go at their own pace. There's times that, that we do push for a particular reason, but it needs it needs that time. Um, so that multi-annual funding, that, you know, having two, three, four-year programmes uh, for this type of work is really, really important, and that continuity. Um, so as I said, we've got a few different options um, there, Deputy, and it is something that, as I said, we will be continuing with this work. I suppose this is my down. final question, Chair, and just to pick up, um, you obviously mentioned there that it's, it's obviously very specialised work that you carry out uh, and has to be carried out by, you know, really trained professionals, I suppose. So on a, on a scale, how many, I, I don't know whether I should call them employees or volunteers, but how many people work in your centre uh, and what type of training do they need that uh, deals with the really important issues um, that you're working on? Sure. So we currently have uh, 14 members of staff. That's a variety that is small. I think about uh, four of us are full time. The rest are part time. We do have some external contractors as well, specialist facilitators and mediators who we work with. Um, we also have a very strong board who are, are all volunteers and standing committees of you know, governance, audit and risk, um, that type of thing. So um, I suppose there, we're a wide network, we're a wide community, and um, there's a lot of people who've you know, kind of committed to Glencree over the years, but it's a relatively small staff team. In terms of training, um, 
So a lot of our, our experts, you know, our program managers, they're experts in their field. They have a wide variety of experience. Again, I mean, this, this woman sitting beside me, um, you know, again, two decades of work on interfaces in the north and um, sitting on the policing authority. You know, when we're recruiting for a program, we look for that unique experience and look, look at that aspect that people can bring in. But really mediation skills and training, facilitation skills and training, but also emotional intelligence, which you can't always teach, that, that ability, that empathy to kind of connect with people. Um, and also a kind of a, a, a very, you know, we're not an advocacy organization, you know, as was putting aside, being able to put beside any kind of personal beliefs and, and focus on the, the process and, you know, the kind of engaging with people in, in that way is, is, is hugely important. And, you know, it, it's it's not always easy for, you know, people in general to do. So um, there is an ongoing kind of training plan with Glen Cree for staff who maybe identify particular areas. But I have to say that people who come to work with Glen Cree are experts in their field and are chosen for the variety of skills that, that they have in a particular area. Um, again, with that, that responsibility we have, um, for people, for what they're going through, for kind of you know high stakes relationship, it's really really important that people have the capacity and the ability to do that. But I also would say for some of the work that is is very very difficult, very raw, particularly the sort of work that Roisin does. Um, you know, you, as a human being, you do absorb that. Um, you know, so that that kind of care, that reflective practice, is something that we um, we're, we're working on providing for our staff in Glencree as well. Um, it is it is very specialist work. I think that the training on the ground as well and be able to observe it is is very very important. But this this kind of feeds into you know a very strong focus for us as we we move into the next five years of Glencree's life. Um, is around you know establishing a formal centre of excellence in Glencree. We've had peace education programmes over the years, but we're deeply committed to helping to upskill and support the next generation of peace builders because that is an area of concern: is who's coming next to continue on this work? You know, there's a lot of, of older voices who, were, who did incredible work, who have huge experience. We can all learn from, uh, who were engaged in the peace process. But what are we doing to support the next generation of, of leaders, of peace builders, of senior civil servants, political representatives, community leaders, um, supporting women to, you know, to have that seat at the decision making table, you know, supporting young people in finding, you know, courage for their voice and opportunities to engage um, and also diverse societies as well, recognising that we're not just an orange and green society anymore, looking at how Ireland has changed as well. So, as I said, for us in, in, within our new strategy, formalising our peace education offering the niche, the 50 years experience that we have is something that we're deeply passionate about as we go into the next five years. Thanks, Nisha. Oh, like just to conclude, Chair, uh, thank you so much for both your presentations. You're both extremely impressive people and you can see how well on top of your brief you are and the excellent work you do. So just thank, thank you so much and apologies, Chair, that I would be here for the second round of questioning later on in the meeting. Yeah, and are you, are you, are you happy enough? With, uh, do you want another yeah. question or two, Senator? No, 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 that was, I, got, I think I should have 15 minutes every week, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Senator McGahan. Deputy Pauline Tully. I can just quickly just say I think it was inappropriate of Senator McGahan to name one party when suggesting that it was only one party or one section of the community that put up inappropriate comments on social media. Unfortunately, all members and supporters of political parties do it, including his own, and it, it shouldn't happen. I don't condone it in any form. But you shouldn't just mention one part. <laughs> no, I think I think uh, just to reply to Debbie Tully, I think that's a fair point. Uh, and once I finished uh, speaking, it's something that I should have said. It was it's equally prevalent on the unionist side as well. But uh, I think that's a fair point, and I take it. Uh, it, it uh, thanks, Debbie Tully. Uh, offensive comments by groups or individuals are, aren't an acceptable anyone. Unfortunately, there's too much of it in life today. Sadly, sadly, and causing grief for a lot of individuals and families. And it's it's a real. Um, a real difficulty for society at the present time, individuals and groups, but not obnoxious statements and comments about people unfounded in many instances, and it's not to be tolerated in political life or in any life, so it's not. Um, Deputy Tully, are you okay? Thank you. Thank you. MP Mickey Brady, are you okay, Mickey? No, um, I have a couple of points to make, um, Chair and th thanks for the opportunity. Um, one of the things that struck me, as somebody who um, lived through the conflict from day one in the six counties, didn't watch it from afar on television, um, but I represent a border county, and I can see the absolute positivities of the Good Friday Agreement in my own constituency. And I wouldn't necessarily accept that society 
and I'm obviously dealing with my own constituency, is more divided. In my view, uh, people are coming together more and more, particularly young people. The other thing that I wanted to raise was, I've been on this committee since uh, 2015, as you have been, Kuhirla. And, you know, when we talk about the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, the referendum in the Board of Poll is an integral part of the Good Friday Agreement. And it seems to me that some members of the committee are more interested in revising parts of the Good Friday Committee than actually implementing it. Now, Neve mentioned there about the 50% plus one, and, you know, what happens the rest of it was only 50% plus one, but that's democracy. And all the politicians around uh, the table here and, and members of the committee, if we were elected on 50 plus one, then I think we'd all be reasonably happy just to be elected. The other point that I would make in terms of Brexit has been mentioned a lot. In my experience in talking to people in Britain, in England particularly, they didn't really know, there was a mismanagement, they didn't really know what they were voting for. And I think in leading up to a border poll, there would have to be serious and, you know, prolonged discussion around what that would actually entail. So that anybody voting in that situation would actually be aware of what they were voting for. Because if you go back to the Brexit situation, the reality is that people in the six counties voted to stay in Europe by 56% to 44 Again, that's democracy. That was ignored. You know, so I think what we need to do is focus on implementing the Good Friday Agreement rather than try and cherry-pick bits and pieces of it. So, Gormi Lamaya got... Thank you. Um, thanks, um, MP uh, Mickey Brady. Neve, do you want to make a comment in regard to Brexit? Um, yeah, just to say that um, I certainly appreciate your, your own experience um, within your own, your own community and absolutely we would also see a great coming together of younger people um, in that, I suppose, you're looking for a more hopeful future and that, that's something that we really want to support. Um, and I absolutely take your point in terms of 50 plus one is, you know, it, it's democracy, but I suppose it, it's the impact of that on the peace process and good relations that we're concerned about, not the vote which way or the other. Um, but I would agree with your point, you know, kind of the, the work that would need to be done around that, you know, information about, about any campaign or any view for what the future might look like. I suppose for us, it, it is about the importance of bringing people along with you as best you can. And the amount of work involved in that, that it would take, I suppose we believe in making that that um, investment, um, you know, in people, in hearing their views, in helping every person um, who is to be in, in, included in, in, in a state, in a country, to feel part of that, um, to feel that they, they, they have a place there, um, whatever that might look like. So that's, I suppose that, that's where we're coming from, maybe with the, those comments. Um, and yeah, I think, look, with the Good Friday Agreement, it is a fabulous achievement, absolutely fabulous achievement. Um, and we would not for a second kind of take away from that. We're very much, um, you know, in support of that clearly. Uh, I would suppose the implementation of it, and as we kind of were focusing on today, the impact um, or our lack of provision for victims and survivors. There's, it's not perfect, no peace process is. So there, there are gaps there, there are things that haven't been implemented. And, you know, that, that's what we're talking about, but that's not to take away um, at all uh, from the, the overall achievement of the Good Friday Agreement. But as I said, I suppose that, you know, there, there's always uh, rays of hope within communities, um, large and small in the north, um, particularly with the young people in terms of how people are coming together, how people are working so hard, some of the organisations, individuals that we work with in the north, working so hard to keep relationships strong, to keep a sense of hope, to keep trying to work together through this. And that's what we want to support in Glencree. Yeah, thanks very much, Neve. Well, I think anybody listening to Roisin or yourself, Neve, would, would be very clear in their hearing that you're, you're very um, complimentary of the achievement of the, of the Good Friday Absolutely. Agreement. You, you said a fabulous achievement, a massive achievement. I think all of us around this table would agree with that. And compliments to the people who made it possible and it's up to all of us to ensure that it's implemented in full. I've often used the phrase, we have not maximised the potential of the agreement. No. There's so much more to be done by, by all of us in this island and by, by Irish and British governments, and that will happen for some time into the future as well. Could I just say, you talked about, about conversations. They're so important. I think Senator Neil Daney reflected the, the, the same thought and the same... Um, it's the same... Um, thought on that particular subject. Could I just say that we're short quite a number of members here today, and I understand some of our colleagues are attending 
uh, non Ireland event, cross border event in Enniskillen, and I think it's a shared island event and it's particularly focused on women's issues, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of my colleagues, Senator Erin McGreegan, spoke to me. She couldn't make it here today because she was attending that important event in Enniskillen. But just when I mentioned Shared Island, Shared Island is facilitating conversations at sectoral level, you know, be it in relation to tourism, be it in relation to different aspects of our everyday living. And I think that's important that we, that we have those conversations at different level, you know, be the community and voluntary sector, be it the people in tourism, hospitality, people in agriculture, people in, in, in different sport. And there are so many issues that are important that we can address on an all Ireland basis that we would that I would like to see. And I think those conversations at sector level are very important. I think that they, they will get to the number of problems much much quicker and maybe to a greater significance than an an, an assembly with every subject matter just before citizen assembly. So I think conversations at, at micro level as well as the macro level are important. You mentioned with the Peace Education Programme, and I see some of your programmes are fu have been funded by the Peace 4 programme. Mm -hmm. The Minister for Public Expenditure, Mike, Deputy Michael McGrath, um, in response to questions I had in the Dáil recently stated that the new Peace Plus programme, hopefully it would be formally signed off by Europe in the not too distant future. And I think it's the desire of the, of the Irish government and the Northern Ireland executive as well to have that programme up in place as soon as possible. And I hope that your, that your project can benefit from the Peace Plus programme. And maybe I'm sure I speak for the committee here when we say that if we can support you in, in your request to the Peace Plus programme, that we value the work that you do because you have been before this committee on a number of occasions. Just with regard to the peace education program, and I, you know, I think if we, if we don't succeed at education, if we don't succeed um, in ensuring that people have better attainments in education and all that, some of the issues that have, have bedeviled society will continue. Mm -hmm. And I believe you know, we had um, integrated education group here recently and they outlined to us the particular difficulties in, in lack of attainment at second, for their education at third level as well. So we, we need improvement in that respect through, through the different strata in education. One of the programmes that I always thought was very beneficial and useful was the Wider Horizons programme. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was our colleague here in the Rock, the Senator, Jeremy Wilson, as Youth Reach Coordinator and County Campaign at the time. Um, he had a number of, of youth training programmes going between groups here in this state and groups in Northern Ireland. And I'm just speaking, as Deputy Tully would know, for our own um, County Cavan Vocational Education Committee at the time, our youth reach centres had, had um, collaboration with similar groups in Northern Ireland. There were youth training programmes and say that the groups in Northern Ireland, they came to their counterparts south of the border, engaged in some of the work and training and learning that they were doing. And similarly, the groups from here travel north. Part of that program then involved travel abroad, the United States, Australia, you know, particularly where there were Irish communities. And Roisin mentioned some of the schools, the university, that had a particular um, focus on, on politics as it applies to our island. And they were involved in vocational programs there. Mm -hmm. Now, I followed up because I attended many of their of their events over the years in my own constituency. And to, to my knowledge, a lot of the context that were made by those young people at that time have continued 20 years on. And I think that is very important. And we were dealing with predominantly the people who, who took part in, in those programs were people who were in second chance education. Youth reach is often um, populated by young people who left formal education but now want to go back, follow a particular course. And in so many instances today, it's great to see those people have come back to second chance education, then they go on to the further education sector. Many of them end up with their primary degrees and, and higher qualifications as well. So I would, that Wider Horizons program doesn't exist nowadays. It's gone for a number of years, but it's, it's that type of program I think can be really, really beneficial where you're targeting people at a particular age group, and I th think we should build on the success of those programmes. You mentioned in your opening comment as well, 
um, hard to reach people. I think it's a very good phrase because it's often the people who don't engage with different groups that they are left out there maybe isolated and, and maybe thinking that there's nobody out there to listen to them or to help them or to understand them. And you know, we all know that in, in our own communities at time where thankfully in Ireland today, we have great um, senior citizens groups where we have very active communities where um, social activities are arranged pre-COVID and, and now resuming as well, post, in, in, resuming now hopefully for the future as well, where groups go in and meet on a social basis once a week or whatever. Now, oftentimes, there, there are still a cohort won't attend those groups. Maybe people live in isolated, live in very lonely lives. And it's just how you reach those people. You know, there, in every walk of life, there'll be that per, small cohort within each um, sector of society that won't be reached. So again, I don't know how we devise a mechanism to get to those people that are hard to reach, but I think that there needs to be a particular focus you know, in all our work on trying to reach those those people. So I commend you that that you that you highlight that within the victims and survivors groups to try to reach. I raised that here with Minister Coveney one day. That you know, was his department satisfied that the uh, families of victims, you know, that th there was engagement with them at official level. Um, you know, in some instances, people haven't sought help, or maybe they haven't been reached out to. So it'd be, it'd be shocking and very disappointing if there are people out there who haven't been given support, or maybe who haven't sought support, and who don't benefit from whatever support schemes are in place. You know, I'm thinking of the work of Wave Trauma and all other advocacy and support groups as well. Look, at, I attended, as other colleagues in this committee did, different Grand Cree events over the years. And I found them very beneficial. In the Chatham House rules, as you could go and talk, in 99% of the time you could talk your mind and you wouldn't be quoted. 99% of it anyway, at least, if not more. But um, I think it's a very good concept. I, I remember being at one of the first um, engagements you had in relation to Brexit. Mm -hmm. And it was very informative. It was very, it was a time when people from our different traditions were very concerned about what it might emerge. But that work that all of us, all of our colleagues spoke about here today, your work in that regard is very important because there are so many issues still to be dealt with. And, and we all know the legacy issues, the, the, we never um, need to take the emphasis away from supporting those people and trying to resolve those issues. And that's not simple as we all know. So um, again, I. I I read out at the beginning quite a number of our colleagues who can't be here, who would like to be here with us today, and to thank you for your for your excellent contributions. And I've no doubt that as a committee, we'll have a further engagement with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this meeting is now adjourned until Thursday, the 24th of February, when we meet with the Committee on the Administration of Justice.